Hi, I'm Roseanne. In my last video, I mentioned that I would be doing a video essay covering the time through the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. Like I've said, it's very fascinating to see how quickly everything fell after the Roaring Twenties, which was thought to be a time of prosperity. Naturally, I will be focusing on those two time periods and how one transitions into the other. I'll also go over the aftermath of the Great Depression. Now, let's begin. The Roaring Twenties the time period between 1920 and 1929 is most commonly known as the Roaring Twenties, starting after the end of World War I and the Spanish Flu. It was a time of economic prosperity, innovation, exciting change, new cultural touchstones, increased personal freedom, and dancing. And for some people, it was a time of wealth. In addition, it was a decade that was all about crossing lines, smashing traditions, shattering multiple boundaries in technological geographical and social ways. If there was anything that the 1920s is known for, that would be the extravagant parties and nightlife consisting of jazz bands, wild fashion, and drinking when it was illegal. In the first month of the new decade, the 18th Amendment declared that the sale of consumption of alcohol was now illegal. However, little to no people paid heed to this and liquor was now being sold behind closed doors in places called speakeasies. Speakeasies made good profit and were worth the risk for both proprietors and consumers. Prohibition led to the rise in organized crimes, and rival gangs battled each other for illegal liquor territories. After World War I, there was an eagerness to embrace the new, and it was in New York where the modern age was born. Movements to cities started during World War I, and this accelerated in 1920, when for the first time, more Americans lived in urban centers than in country towns and villages. Many great things were happening in the streets of New York. Broadway would represent the best and latest in American entertainment. Madison Avenue would represent bustling new businesses of advertising that shared the nation's fantasies. And Wall Street would represent expanding economic opportunities. Numerous immigrants from Europe came to Ellis Island, and Asian Americans came to Angel Island. Southern and Eastern European immigrants were often Catholic and Jewish, and they sought after the American dream. In the 1920s, the number of millionaires jumped from 400% over the previous decade. This lavish lifestyle of theirs would come to fuel the dreams and hope for limitless horizons. They had multiple houses and other places to spend summer, winter, maids for everything, and enormous yachts. Wealth increased partly because the government did not regulate business as closely as they do now. People under the system of laissez-faire capitalism believed that economic success was more probable if the government wasn't as involved. Parties were everywhere, and so was music. The popular form of music at the time was jazz. Its capital was in Harlem, where you could see many famous performers such as Louis Armstrong, Betty Smith, Edward Kennedy, Duke. People from all over the world came to experience what was going on in America. Harlem would contribute more than music as New York flourished with political, social, and cultural activity and sought to celebrate the African American experience, which was later called the Harlem Renaissance. New York was perhaps the most mixed city, racially, ethnically, in the country. But every city was important since change was centered in the cities, business, industry, and culture. In the 1920s, the Republican Party dominated politics, and so, quote, the federal government hewed to the policies favored by business lobbyists, including lower taxes on personal income and business profits, and efforts to weaken the power of unions. End quote. To further their advantage, Presidents Harding, Cooling, and Hoover stocked the boards of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Trade Commission with men who shared their pro-business views. This shifted the country away from economic regulation that had been favored by progressives. The Supreme Court was the only segment of the government that kept any progressive ideas alive, crafting a system of ideas that we now call, quote, the jurisprudence of civil liberties. End quote. Though the court voted to uphold convictions of the left-wing critics of the government, they gradually began to embrace the idea that people had the right to express their dissonant views, which Oliver Wendling 
poems called, quote, the marketplace of ideas, end quote. In Near v. Minnesota, the Supreme Court struck down censorship of newspapers. Most of the government corruption can be traced to the administration of Warren G. Harding. Though he wasn't as corrupted, the men that surrounded him were greatly. But productivity was dramatically increasing thanks to the industries that adopted Henry Ford's assembly line techniques. Quote, Throughout the 1920s, new technologies would transform daily life. At the beginning of the decade, most Americans lived without electricity, end quote, using lamps and candles for light. But American cities were lit up in the 20s, and newer industries like aviation, chemicals, and electronics offered both products and opened up possibilities for work and play. Now, at the end of the decade, the majority of American homes had electricity. Cars or automobiles became revolutionary and gave Americans the freedom to travel and escape from their usual scenery. During this time, the annual productions of cars tripled to 4.8 million and automobile companies were gradually conciliated into the three General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, and Harley-Davidson. By 1929, half of all American families owned a car, and by the mid-decade, the government was spending more than $1 billion on the construction of highways, bridges, and tunnels, the beginning of a national infrastructure. Corporations then extended their reach overseas, hence American foreign investment became greater than that of any country. The pound was replaced by the dollar, the most important currency. Well, by the end of the decade, America is producing 85% of the world's cars and 40% of its overall manufactured goods. Companies introduced many labor-saving devices, such as vacuum cleaners, toasters, refrigerators, and became necessary for modern life. These devices gave Americans more time for leisure, thus being provided by radios, baseball games, boxing matches, vacation, dancing, and most notably known, movies. More people had money to see those movies due to consumer debt. The 20s is known for extravagant selling and spending, and this was made possible with the, with the combination of assembly lines, radio advertising, and credit slash installment plans. As families and singles took their new car for a ride, they would be greeted with the new phenomenon of roadside advertising. The new developments created the birth of mass media and advertising. Quote, advertising helped transform not just a physical landscape but a cultural one. Along with advertising came the expansion of a brand new consumer concept. End quote. Credit was introduced and the saying, buy now, pay later, was a very appealing one to customers as everything from cars to clothing could be bought at once. Quote, by 1927, 75% of all household goods were bought on credit and in the last years of the decade, the most desired was the radio, end quote. This item became a national phenomenon as just as important as the car, and within six months, every store in America was now selling radios. It became a new form of communication and connected hundreds of listeners as they listened to the same thing and laughed at the same jokes. Not only were there technological changes, but also social changes as well especially for American women as they asserted newfound freedom. An expanding job market gave women new careers and disposable income that they could do with what they wished. In 1920, women gained the right to vote after 81 years of agitation. With newfound freedom came changes in women's fashion and looks. They had kept their hair and skirts short and went and drank in bars and wild parties. The more daring women came to be known as flappers, a subculture of young western women in the 20s, and the symbol for the bold and rebellious spirit of women. Marketers were encouraged women to buy products such as cigarettes, but most women were still expected to marry, care for their children, and home. The shattering ways of 1920s city life was spread by the media to rural America where change was not as accepted. This country was brought up on religion and respect for God, and that is the way they raise their children. Such new ideas threatened the roots of religion, so to them, huge cities seemed threatening to many people in small towns as a breeding ground for new and often quote-unquote alien ideas. Tensions between science, education, and religious beliefs arose in a famous trial in the summer of 1925 
Maine and Tennessee, involving a man named John Scopes who was tried for breaking the law against teaching evolution. The prosecutor being three times presidential candidate and Christian fundamentalist William Jennings Bryan, the defendant Clarence, Clarence Darrow, who was celebrated Chicago trial lawyer. In response, Danans had itself a carnival. There would be people bringing trained chimpanzees dressed in suits and ties, leaning them up and down the streets. The slogan, quote, read your Bible, end quote, was everywhere in town, with different preachers at the end of each street. Newspaper people from all over the world, France, Spain, England, were lined up to cover the story. It ended with John Scopes being found guilty and fined 100, which was overturned on its technicality. It said, quote, what Scopes represented and what the world came to witness was a colossal clash of ideals, end quote. Nevertheless, the case drew national attention and ultimately led to evolution being taught more in American schools. Quote, in a decade fraught with so many changes, people in the 1920s seemed hungry for old-fashioned heroes, and an explosion in spectator sports provided them, end quote. The Giants became a household name for sports. Famous people at the time were sports players, and no player was as famous as the well-known Babe Ruth. He excelled at the game's biggest excitement, the home run, hitting 60 of them in the single season in 1927, a record that would stand strong for four decades. He had fans from miles around to see him play and took pictures and signed autographs for them. Lo Jering, Jake Debson, and many more would come to be known as the idea of celebrities. Oprah singer Enric Carso had been often called the first modern celebrity, though he is less famous now than Charlie Chaplin or Rudolph Valentino. High culture flourished, which was the age of the quote last generation end quote of American writers. Quote the public's fascination with flying in the 1920s seemed fitting for a time when even gravity couldn't hold down progress and when every boundary seemed just waiting to be broken." In May of 1927, a man named Charles Lindbergh was ready to take off to Paris in a plane called the Spirit of St. Louis. Quote, no one had ever flown solo across the Atlantic before. Six others had tried, failed, and died. End quote. But here, Charles decided to take a chance and when he took off, the Western world wondered and prayed. The night was on Saturday when a person yelled out, they found him, end quote. He flew over Ireland and within an hour, he landed in Paris. 100,000 Parisians were there to welcome him as he emerged from the plane. Quote, his flight had represented the best of an era, a mastery of modern technology joined with the old fashioned values of courage, end quote. People celebrated when he returned. His parade is the biggest national celebration since the end of World War I. Quote, after Lindbergh's triumph, there was only one continent to conquer, Antarctica, end quote. And so, Admiral Richard Bright set out to accomplish the goal of flying over the South Pole. This expedition attracted many young volunteers and 120 men connected with Bright's expedition. Little America, the name of the home expedition, was tasked with the two-year goal of conducting geological research and preparing for Bride's record-breaking attempt. Quote, after midnight on November the 29th of 1929, Admiral Bride's aircraft flew 500 feet above the geographic South Pole. He dropped a stone wrapped in an American flag. Americans and their airplane had reached the ends of the earth, end quote. So, by the end of 1920, it seemed that anything was possible. The only future America would have seemed promising. Americans were on their way to riches, and this was no clear in the stock market. Anyone could join since there was no regulation, so everyone made money. The boom in buying had driven up stock prices. Quote, suddenly in October 1929, investors started cashing in their overpriced stocks. The panic of selling started, and the opening bells rang as it was clear that things were in miss. Crowds started to gather in the streets outside of the exchange, but at 3 o'clock the bell rang, and that was it. More than $30 billion in paper money vanished that day, and the stock market crashed. Just like their money, people's optimism was gone. There was no pensions or Medicare or Social Security. If you lost your money, that was it. Now people had to face a new decade much different than the one before, the Great Depression.
Soon this would come to envelop from American cities to the entire nation. The Depression Before the Great Depression In 1921, the first immigration restriction was passed, limiting the number of immigrants from Europe to 357,000. Quote, in 1924, a new immigration law dropped that number to 150,000 and established quotas based on national origin. The number of immigrants allowed from Southern and Eastern Europe were drastically reduced, and Asians except for Filipinos were forbidden, end quote. So at 50 per year, though they were allowed to immigrate to Hawaii for labor needs. Restrictions on immigration from the Western Hemisphere didn't exist, because California's large-scale farms were dependent on seasonal laborers from Mexico. Such immigration laws stemmed from radical anarchist and pseudoscience scientific ideas about race. The widespread use of credit and layaway buying plans meant it was acceptable to go to debt to maintain what was seen as the American standard of living, and that meant that the economy was going to crash eventually. Wealth was not equally distributed. Real industrial wages rose by a quarter between 1922 and 1929, but corporate profits rose at twice that rate. In 1929, 1% of the nation's banks controlled 50% of the nation's financial resources, and the wealthiest 5% American share of the national income exceeded that of bottom, that of the bottom 60%. It's estimated that 40% of Americans lived in poverty. Still, Americans glorified big businesses, partly because 1.5 million Americans owned some kind of stock. This caused small businesses to disappear, and the number of manufacturing workers declined by 5%, and it was the first time this class of workers had seen the numbers drop. In New England, unemployment began steadily increase as de-industrialization of textile companies moved their operations to the south where labor was cheaper. The majority of America was still working class people who couldn't afford newer devices and in 1930, 75% of American homes didn't have a washing machine and 40% of them had a radio. Farmers had prospered during World War I when the government subsidized farms prices kept their farms producing because of the war effect. But when the subsides ended, production wasn't as suitable, largely due to the mechanization and increased use of fertilizer. The farming industry suffered from overproduction. Due to the, incre due to the decrease in demand, this led to a decrease in prices as well. There was also compensation from foreign imported goods. Farmers who couldn't pay had to foreclose on their farms. Their incomes dropped and steadily many saw banks foreclose upon their property, leading to the first decline of numbers of the numbers of farms. The drought in the mid-1920s also affected farmers and played a part in the decline of the farming industry. The government in turn did nothing to help its workers or farmers. The 1920s was a period where the tolerance became an important value, but at the same time, it was a rise of lynching. While immigrants were seen as necessary for economic growth, their numbers were also restrained due to being seen as a threat to traditional American values. The Great Depression, or the Wall Street Crash of 1929. Stocks were necessary for businesses to expand their services slash products. Buyers believed that putting money into business was their easy way to get rich. But a stock's value is linked to how well the company is doing, and at that time there was no way to check how a company was doing. Uh, in the late 1920s, stock prices rose high because people were allowed to buy stock on credit They were buying that they were buying quote-unquote on margin. Nevertheless, there was so much confidence in the stock market that buyers did not realize it was possible to lose all their money. The Great Depression began after the stock market, but not because of it. The conditions of 1920s were already relatively unstable with the fuel of consumer consumption that was credit and installment buying. And because of that, it worsened. You see, credit works well unless and until economic uncertainty increases. The reason being, American farms had expanded tremendously during World War I to feed soldiers and that led many farmers to mechanize their operations, which was very expensive and led to debt. Quote, 
By 1929, the growth of car manufacturing slowed along with regi- residential construction, end quote. And in 1927, stock markets were labeled, quote, an orgy of mad speculation, end quote. To be clear, the stock market crash and the Great Depression were not the same thing. Though many people did lose their money, what defined the Great Depression was the massive unemployment and unaccompanying hardships starting in 1930 and or 1931. What actually caused the Great Depression is difficult for economists to pinpoint. Quote, only 3% of Americans actually owned stock and the market recovered a lot of their value by the 1930s, end quote though they did go down because of the depression. Corporations had bought many stocks with borrowed money and this still did not sink the world's economy. During this time, the US's banking system was very weak. Banks lent excessive amounts of money, so much so that they were running out of money to loan people and too much credit was given to people who couldn't make payments back on time. In 1913, The Federal Reserve System was created, but the vast majority of American banks were small, quote, individual institutions that had to rely on their own resources, end quote. So whenever panic rose and depositors rushed to take their money out, the bank would likely go under due to insufficient money on reserves. Quote, in 1930, a wave of bank failures began in Louisville and then spread to Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and eventually Arkansas and North Carolina, end quote. Before depositors took out their money, the banks called in loans and sold assets, leading to credit freezing. Now, a frozen credit system meant that there was less money in circulation, and ultimately that led to deflation. Deflation meant that businesses had to cut costs because of the prices dropping, and they did this by laying off workers. Those workers were unable to buy and so inventories continued to build up and prices dropped further. Quote, banks weren't lending money, so employers couldn't borrow it to make payroll to pay their workers and more and more businesses went bankrupt, leaving more and more workers unable to purchase the goods and services that would keep the businesses open. End quote. So if there's anyone to blame for the Great Depression, it would be the banks. This might be a little too simple, but the Federal Reserve did not rescue the banks nor infuse money into the economy in an attempt to combat this deflationary cycle. Herbert Hoover offered an explanation for the Great Depression in his memoir, claiming that the primary cause was World War I. This is partly true as it set a stage for a global economic disaster due to the debts and reparation it created. Well, under the Versailles Treaty, Germany had to pay $33 billion in reparations, mostly to France and Britain, which it couldn't pay without borrowing money from American banks. In addition, the U.S. was owed $10 billion by Britain and France, some of which those countries paid back with German reparations, end quote. But as American credit dried up, the economies of Germany, France, and Britain also fell. And being the largest non-U.S. industrial economies meant that fewer people abroad could buy American products and other foreign products, making world trade stop. Quote, America responded by raising tariffs to the highest level ever with the Haley Smut Tariff, a law that was meant to protect their industry but caused America to have fewer buyers, less trade, fewer sales, and ultimately fewer jobs. End quote. The government wasn't overseeing the stock market and banks trusted the market in being able to correct itself. Two-thirds of businesses were controlled by holding companies or large businesses that owned many smaller businesses and to whom they provided direction and management to. Unequal distributions of wealth were evident. The Great Depression had tormented Americans for three years when 20,000 army veterans and their families came to Washington to find out what the government was planning to do. They had been promised the bonus for their service in World War I. It was due to be paid until 1945, but they desperately wanted it now. Quote, on July 28th, the bonus army came to blows with Washington. Police shots were fired. President Herbert Hoover barricaded himself in the White House and called out the troops. End quote. The day was chaotic, and when the smoke cleared, two veterans and an infant were found dead. After a decade of prosperity, almost overnight, the Wall Street crash of 1929 occurred. 
Over 16 million shares were traded and $14 billion were lost, being $206 billion now. In one day, the stock market fell by 25%. By 1923, stocks were worth 20% of what they were before the crash. Panic from the crash caused a run on banks, but the banks had been over lending, so they didn't have enough money to give. Businesses lost all their investors, leaving them unable to pay back their loans. As businesses began to fail, over 12 million people lost their jobs due to cuts in spending. By 1933, 24.9% of people in the U.S. were unemployed. With each day came more bankruptcies and more layoffs, and it ended with less money in people's pockets. One year after the crash, 800 had failed. 9 million saving accounts were wiped out. The banks had completely ruined people's lives with no saving and layoffs increasing. People had no choice but to sell the things they had. Cars, furniture, wedding rings. Quote, Before long, half of the country's mortgages were in default. Americans found themselves facing eviction. One year after the crash, 4 million American families were lived without any means of support. End quote. They didn't know how to ask for it, and the government was unsure of how to provide it since they had very little impact on ordinary people before. The depression had hit the country everywhere from farms to cities. Quote, by 1931, hard times seemed to be everywhere, but if you could still spare a dime, you could slip into the glamorous world where the roaring 20s had never ended. End quote. The Grand Lake Theater. There weren't any TVs, only radios, but orchestras, movies, and films would play for six and seven hours. It, as well as dancing, was escapism for people. During the Depression, the radio was an appliance they couldn't do without. There were many people transfixed on dramas on the radio, where voice actors read from scripts and sound effects done in a studio. Farmers at the time were already struggling, and it only worsened when 25,000 square miles of farmland, aka the Dust Bowl, in 1930 occurred as the dust storms in the, bay, in the area became stronger as a result of drought and poor farming practices. They left their farms and houses and headed to California, as many others did on train, but each destination seemed as hopeless as the place they came from. There were radical movements like the communists gaining influence and converts. Quote, President Hoover misread the danger signals and did nothing to ease the suffering, end quote. This made people lose faith and some fled from the country. About 100,000 Americans moved to the Soviet Union in order to build communism. There was work for anyone that wanted work, and at the time it seemed like a land of great promise. Regarding the foreign debt issue, Hoover proposed a moratorium on intergovernmental debt payments and got Congress to go along with it, but it was not a law quote, mainly because central bankers in Europe and America refused to go to go of the gold standard, which would have allowed governments to devalue their currency and pump needed money into their economies, end quote. While Britain abandoned the gold standard in 1931 and stopped payments in gold, the U.S. did not follow suit, meaning world financial markets froze up even further. Only worsening the situation, the Federal raised its discount rate, making credit even harder to come by. Quote, By the end of 1931, 2,229 American banks had failed, double the number uh, that had gone under in 1930. End quote. Hoover believed that the best course of action was to use the power of government to cushion the situation, and in a White House meeting, he persuaded a large number of industrialists to agree to maintain wage rates. In addition, he got the Federal Farm Board to support agriculture production and got congressional approval for $140 million in new public works. Well, overall, he nearly doubled the federal public works expenditures between 1929 and 1931. End quote. This was not enough, since he didn't allow the federal government to take over the situation completely. Hoover, quote, relied primarily on private businesses and state and local governments to stimulate the economy, and that was insufficient, end quote. In 1929, federal expenditures accounted for 3% of our gross domestic product, in comparison to today, which is 
so there was not much to expect from them, who were high taxes, quote, to stabilize the banks by balancing the federal budget, providing confidence for foreign creditors, and stop them from buying American gold, end quote. This would support bonds and keep the federal government out of the competition with private borrowers. In January of 1932, Hoover and Congress created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, quote, a federal bailout program that borrowed money to provide emergency loans to banks, building and loan societies, railroads, and agricultural corporations, end quote. This did not impede the Great Depression, which started to take shape by 1932. Quote, by 1932, well over 10 million people were out of work, 20% of the labor force, end quote. This was especially worse for colored people in big cities. For example, in Chicago, uh, African Americans made up for 4% of the population, but they made up for more than 16% of the unemployed. Many Americans were forced to ask for a relief, and Hoover tried to encourage private charity through the President's Organization on Unemployment Relief, AK poor. New York's government relief programs rose from 9 million to 58 million in 1932. And private charitable giving did increase from 4.5 million to 20 million, end quote. It seemed promising, but to put it in perspective, the total of 70 of 79 million that New York City spent on relief in 1932 was only one was only less than one month's lost wage for the 800,000 people who were unemployed. The Great Depression spread beyond American borders. In Germany, harsh conditions were only becoming more dangerous. There was mass unemployment, protests with slogans like give us bread and give us jobs, and unrest and disorder in the streets. People needed a leader and this was the rise of Hitler in Germany who swayed public opinion with his powerful speeches. Hitler's rapidly growing Nazi party took 37% vote in the parliamentary elections, which was not the majority he had to hold on the other parties. This new strength allowed him to seize the chancellorship of Germany and knock down any opposition to his rule. Quote, on January 30th, in 1933, his followers celebrated his ascension to power with a torchlight victory par parade through Berlin, end quote. Harsh times and desperation had begun the Nazi era. 1932 was also the year of U.S.'s re-election. Quote, President Herbert Hoover campaigned for re-election, only to find that everywhere his, he went, his name had become synopsis with failure. Shanty towns of unemployed men were now called Hoovervilles. Newspapers were Hoover blankets, empty pockets, Hoover flags, end quote. FDR from the Democratic Party, promising a new deal, won the election. He was optimistic, but had to face the biggest challenge of American leaders. For the 4 million unemployed in 1930 had turned into 16 million by 1933, 25% of Americans' workforce. The Aftermath We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. It's a quote from FDR's speech on Inauguration Day in 1933. He worked decisively to restore confidence in the country's financial system. Firstly, he closed the nation's bank and ordered the treasury to rush them to billion dollars in currency. And when the banks reopened, the deposits exceeded withdrawals. Quote, in his first hundred days in White House, Roosevelt moved at a breathtaking pace, regulating businesses, helping farmers, pumping new money into the economy. End quote. It was a welcome and massive intervention. He, control, he continued by putting people on the government payroll when private businesses didn't hire them fast enough. The wild boys became part of the civilian conservation corps, planting trees and building roads across America. Millions of Americans had been helped in the first year of the New Deal, but for many more it ended in frustration. 1934 was perhaps the most radical mood of the Great Depression. President Roosevelt had contributed to that mood when he became the first American president to say labor had the right to unionize, unionize, but businesses remained firmly anti-union. In the spring of 1934, emboldened dock workers closed ports all along the Pacific coasts. In San Francisco, their strike turned violent, end quote. 
Two men were killed, presumably by the police, and the shocked people. 50,000 people attended the strikers' funerals. Citizens were furious, and the strike was stronger than ever. All work stopped. And in 1934, there were more than 1,800 strikes for union recognition. The labor unrest was only one of FDR's problems in 1924. He also had to deal with the economic crisis stall, which critics complained that he had gone too far. Quote, the constitutionality of some new deals were being challenged in the courts, end quote, and businesses and business leaders believe that FDR seared the country recklessly to the left. This discontent and frustration gave rise to a number of demagogues. This included the radio priest Father Kubling, Dr. Francis Townsend, quote, so proclaimed advocate for the elderly, end quote, and radical spellbinders who claimed the New Deal was sighing. In 1934, Huey Long, nicknamed the Kingfish, was a former Louisiana governor who would be the most vocal against FDR and his New Deal. He had promised to soak money from the rich and give it to the poor. It was appealing since the New Deals were not focused on being against the rich, an ideology that had been building up in the Great Depression. He promised American homes and radios, had his own police force, and showed his contempt against democratic practices. It was the beginning of a dictatorship dictatorship. This caused a great deal of worry in Washington, both in Southerners and Midwestern farmers. Well, by 1935, Franklin Roosevelt was primarily calling Huey Long the most dangerous man in America, end quote. But in September of 1935, he was killed before he got a chance to run for president. FDR pushed Congress to create social security programs, welfare for the poor, and jobs for 8 million people. This was called the Second Hundred Days and completely reshaped American life. There was now for the first time a system of unemployment, compensation of old age, pension, and centralized system. Roosevelt signed the Social Security Bill, which gave people who have retired money every month. He signed a bill that created the FDIC, which secures the money you put into the bank, and the SEC, to prevent another stock market crash. Factories had to reopen to produce materials for the war, and farms had to grow more produce for troops. In turn, men went to war, and women took jobs to support their families and the war effort. Quote, by 1930, there was visible scenes of recovery, end quote. People had jobs, and they were getting paid. And campaigning for a second term in 1936, Roosevelt told the crowd, you look happier today than you did four years ago. And they were. FDR was re-elected by the greatest margin in the history of American politics. Quote, in the first four years since President Roosevelt had taken office, America experienced a revolution, end quote, and his New Deal programs transformed the country's landscape. Questions that surround this time are still relevant today, for example, talking about how to regulate banking, what the government's role in economic policy should be, and whether a strong federal government is ultimately good for an economy or bad for it. Whatever your opinion on the government is in general, it is going to affect how you see the government's role in the Great Depression. But those ideological feelings about markets and governments and economies should not obscure the suffering that millions of Americans experienced. Thanks for watching until the end. This was a very interesting topic to research. The idea that America was at its prime just to be overtaken by a sudden depression. I had heard that the Great Depression ranked 20s before. But it never seemed quite real before, and it was just sort of like an idea to me. And growing up in an age of technology, it seemed strange that the 20s were just getting started with modern ways of communication. But when writing this report, I was able to understand a little bit more about the life of these people. I understand that the Roaring Twenties were not at all that glamorous as they seem, but they're still very important for American history, and I sympathize with the people who were victims of the banking system. References will be down in the description. I highly, highly recommend you to check it all out. There's so much more information. I still don't know what the topic for my next video will be, but I'm sure it will be just as interesting as this one. So please subscribe, click the notifications button to be notified of those videos, and I hope to see you all again soon. Goodbye!